you have a Bible, if you'd open to Ecclesiastes 5, you guys blow the dust off of Ecclesiastes. Not many pastors talk about Ecclesiastes. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's com- almost always misunderstood. Uh, I think it's a fantastic book. It's really seen as sort of a cynical, negative book, but it's really not cynical or negative. It's real. And what Solomon does in the, in the book of Ecclesiastes, is he, he actually, his opening sentence, I think, is, doesn't he say vanity of vanity, all is vanities? Isn't that the opening of Ecclesiastes? So he just says, hey, everything is vain. And he's not, he's really not being negative. He's just saying, I want you to get a clear grasp on what life is like. And so he sort of puts things in columns. And there's only a couple of things over here that are valuable. And then there's a whole bunch that sort of, at the end of the day, it doesn't amount to much. And so he gives you a real picture of what doesn't amount to much so that we can clearly see the few things that matter. Amen? Does that make sense? So uh, Merry Christmas, by the way. Happy New Year. I'm excited to be alive right now. I'm excited about all that God is doing. I'm excited that I'm not perfect, but I'm on the journey. And uh, I get to do the journey with people like you, which is amazing. We get to celebrate the birth of Jesus. This is just a good time. It's a good time. I love this time of year. Don't you? If you don't love this time of year, you will by the time we're done. All right? Does that sound good? We've been talking about joy and hope and um, looking at the concept of joy and hope as a series. How do you access it? What does it look like? And so we're going to go there again. Um, You can go ahead to that next slide that says joy and hope. That would be awesome. Good job. And uh, so one of the things I just sort of, just to summarize, is that we're an intense group, and we're going after a lot of stuff. And in the midst of that, we need to have our hearts watered with joy and hope. So we don't lose our joy and hope in the midst of our intensity. Does that sound good? I believe Jesus is just like he served the disciples at the Last Supper. I believe he's serving us up some joy and hope in the midst of all of our intensity and all of our desires and all of our goals and all of our stuff. So, And yeah, uh, we're going to do this experiment. I realize it's a busy time. Uh, if three of you show up, we'll just minister to three of you. But next Saturday, is it next Saturday, Rich? What time is it? T- ten, 10 to noon. So two hours to talk about a week-long seminar that we did on destiny and goals. We're going to pack it into two hours. And, and really, if you need a little kickstart on the idea of goals. This isn't sort of rah-rah so you can feel like a failure two weeks after the New Year's. This is a little more in-depth than that, sort of the why behind the what and how to do that. And So hopefully it'll help you if you uh, want to set, if you want to go somewhere, we're going to help you see goals in a biblical context. Does that sound good? Awesome. All right, so uh, before we read Ecclesiastes 5, if you have a Bible, if you'd hold it up, we're going to make a declaration. I brought my big Bible today. This one actually almost takes two hands to hold up. It's, it's so big. It's a giant print. So, yeah. If I show it, see, look at it. You can probably see the text from where you're sitting. Look at that. Isn't that crazy? It's really, really fun to read. I love this Bible. Anyway, we're going to make a declaration. Ready? Here we go. In your presence is fullness of joy, and you are the God of hope. We want to live life with inexpressible joy and everlasting hope. So please fill our hearts now with joy and hope through your word and by your spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So just before we read Ecclesiastes 5, just remind you that we've been talking about joy and hope, and we started with the idea of gratitude right around Thanksgiving, just the importance of gratitude. It's the secret sauce of the Christian life. It's the the one thing that can change your mood in under five minutes. If you just start giving thanks, you cannot be as angry or depressed or as sad as you used to be. It's just, it's impossible. And I love that about the Word of God. It's just true. It just works. Amen? And, uh, and then we talked about this idea, okay, well, now that we know that, how do we really access joy and hope? And I, I felt like the Lord gave me a little download on the word riches, and that each of those letters, R-I-C-H-E-S, is, a, is actually, it's three sets of two paradoxes, I call them a paradox cycle, so you have to, you have to ride the paradox cycle in scripture, and so we looked at uh, R-I, so that was relaxed intensity, do you remember that? And then last week we looked at C-H, which was contented hunger, remember that? And today we're going to look at the E and the S, which is another one of those paradoxes, they're both equally true. When I say paradox, what I mean is it's not 50-50, it's 100-100. So that's why uh, I don't mind the word balance as long as it means 100, 100. If balance means 50, 50, I'm not into it because it's not, it's, not, it's not balance. Biblical balance is always about fullness. 
So it's all of one thing plus all of another. That's the biblical concept of balance, all right? So as long as we're using it correctly, it's a good word. But we're going to look at the E and the S of the riches of joy and hope because I believe they actually give us access in a practical way to joy and hope. Sometimes we say these words, joy and hope, and we sing them, and then we have Christmas carols, and we have bells, and, but we don't actually know how to get there. And so I, what I'm trying to do is give you what I believe are practical ways to pedal your life into joy and hope. Amen? Not pedal like a pedal, you know, pedal. <laughs> P-E-D-A-L not P-E-D-D-L-E. I just want you to know I'm having fun. <laughs> so. You may not, but I am. All right, let's read Ecclesiastes 5. I'm going to read verses 10 through 20 in the New Living Translation, okay? We're not going to put it on the screen, but I just want to let you know. Okay, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless, notice it doesn't say those who have money. It says those who love money, all right? How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. Don't you find that's true? <laughs> isn't that an awesome way to say that? That's so good, isn't it? So what good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? <laughs> Do you hear the cynicism in this sort of, this is the thing about Ecclesiastes. It's so awesome because he's being so real, but he's actually trying to make a point. So don't get lost in the cynicism. Stay with it. And just laugh because it's all true. He's using what's called hyperbole. Hyperbole in scripture means you sort of emphasize one thing to the point of ridiculousness, but it's actually true. All right. Verse 12, people who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much, but the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. Now, he's not, that's not totally true, but what he's, he's trying to say something, all right? He's trying to talk about the, the, when you're after riches. I'm sure there's rich people that sleep really well. Probably better than a lot of other people, but he's trying to make a point, okay? So when you read, by the way, when you read, I want to encourage you to get a book called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by uh, Gordon Fee and Stuart, I can't remember his first name, but basically there are different genres. Everyone say genre. Genre means type. There are different genres of literature in the Bible. So there's, there's uh, narrative, which is history. There's epistles, which are instructional letters. And then there's uh, revelatory, like uh, Daniel, Reve there's prophets, revelation, but there's also uh, poetry. And so uh, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes are all poetic books. And they're to be interpreted differently than other books of the Bible. And so I encourage you, if you don't know that, you should get how to read the Bible for all it's worth, because it'll help you understand how to read different genres of scripture. It's almost never taught. In, in the church, like how to read the Bible, how to understand the Bible. But, but the Bible is a collection of 66 different books with different kinds of paradigms. They're written from different types of paradigms over 1,600 years, 40 different authors. So there's just some things we need to know in order to interpret the Bible well. Amen? All right, so this is poetry. So in poetry, it's a lot like the parables in the, in the Gospels. The Lord's looking, he's, he's the God, in parables and in poetry, God's going for the big target. So he makes statements they're, they're poetic statements. They're, they're sort of like, they're not, comp it, they're not universal statements like laws. They're, he's just making it, there's a principle within the statement. Does that make sense? That's why I'm saying it says the rich don't. Well, of course there's rich people that sleep. So it's not that it's not true. He's just trying to make a statement that when you're worried about riches, it, it disturbs your sleep. And it's true. When you're worried about poverty, it, destroy, it disturbs your sleep. So either way. All right, but we're going to keep going. Verse 14. Uh, excuse me, verse 13. There is another serious problem I have seen under the sun. Hoarding riches harms the saver. Money is put into risky investments that turn sour and everything is lost. In the end, there is nothing left to pass on to one's children. We all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty-handed as the day we were born. We can't take our riches with us. And this, too, is a very serious problem. People leave this world. No, by the way, if you have money, we're not beating up on you today, so it's okay. You, it's good that you have money. Uh, we're trying to make a point about how to experience joy and hope. All right, so stay focused. People leave this world no better off than when they came. All their hard work is for nothing like, live, like working for the wind. Throughout their lives, verse 17, they live under a cloud, frustrated, uh, discouraged, and angry. Now, watch verse 18. Everything changes in verse 18. Got to catch the tone change here. Even so, in other words, that's all one truth. Even so becomes the transitional word to a new truth. Are you guys with me? 
even so, I've noticed one thing at least that is good. It is good for people to eat, drink, and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life God has given them and to accept their lot in life. And it is a good thing to receive wealth from God. Now listen, that almost sounds contradictory, doesn't it? It is a good thing to receive wealth from God and the good health to enjoy it. To enjoy your work and accept your lot in life, this is indeed a gift from God. Verse 20, God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. Now that is so powerful. Wow. So the riches of joy and hope belong to enjoyable believers. All right, that's the E. The E is enjoyable. If you go to the next slide, enjoyable believers. All right, we want to become enjoyable, enjoying those who enjoy life, those who enjoy God, those who enjoy the things he gives us. We want to become enjoyable believers. Now, I got good news. If you're an enjoyable believer in here, you're going to feel like, finally, someone's vindicating who I am. So that's awesome. So we're all called to be enjoyable believers, not just a few of us. Not, not half of us are enjoyable and half are the S word, which we're going to get to in a minute. <laughs> but we're all enjoyable believers, all right? So Solomon is really talking about enjoyment as a key to joy and hope. Of course, the middle of the word enjoyment is joy, right? So this scripture is really about joy, and let's just look at it for a minute. I want to just point out a few things. First of all, Solomon, the guy who's writing this is uniquely qualified to write this. Number one, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now, I'm not trying to be uh, difficult with you, but concubines were basically sex objects, okay? So he had a thousand women at his disposal, 700 wives, three, and I'm not, bra I'm not, we're not bragging about this. We're not saying this is right. We're trying to help you see something, okay? These are called facts. These are the facts. This is what Solomon experienced. Now, for a lot of men in today's society, this would be like a dream. He had a dream situation, all right? He did. Of course, the Bible says this was actually Solomon's downfall because he had so much love for his wives that he lost his love for the Lord. The Bible actually evaluates Solomon's life and says he was half-hearted for God because it got so caught up in this. Of course, Solomon's the guy who wrote Song of Solomon. Isn't it strange how God uses imperfect people? Eternal, eternally in the word of God, a polygamist of the biggest, in the biggest way in the history of the world. The biggest polygamist in the history of the world writes a book of the Bible. Actually, a few, right? It's crazy, isn't it? But that's the redemptive nature of God. He'll use people even like us. Isn't it amazing? You're like, well, I'm not Solomon. I know, you're you. <laughs> you got your own stuff. <laughs> but here's the thing. So Solomon had this, he had, whether you are dis disgusted by his life or not, he did have a unique perspective, didn't he? He knew what he was talking about when it came to wives, he, you know, at least sexual intimacy. All right. But it wasn't just that. He also had complete financial freedom. He was the wealthiest guy on the earth. He had just treasuries of gold and tons of money just, just pouring in, lots of storehouses. So he had, just think if you had, you know, he's talking about rich people. He was the richest guy around. He had the most sexual opportunity for fulfillment. He had the most financial opportunity for fulfillment, all right? I mean, the richest guy on the earth at that time. And then he also had the, probably the most opportunity for fulfilling his own dreams and destinies. He had tons of workers and servants. He was the king in the land. He lived in the golden age right after the Davidic kingdom. So he was the son, right? So he was the son of David. So he had he actually had everything at his disposal. So if he wanted to create a project, if he wanted to try a new aqueduct system, he would just say, give me a thousand guys, let's build that. At the end, he could say, nah, scrap it, let's try. Like he had the freedom to try any dream, any project that he wanted. So sexual, financial, uh, dream, destiny. And then he also had uh, wisdom. He had tremendous wisdom. He was the, aside from Jesus, he's the wisest human being that ever lived on the planet. I just want you to see who wrote this scripture. He had complete access to the research of his day. He knew more than anybody else. He just had tremendous wisdom and knowledge. 
and could make judgment calls in an instant. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit to make great judgment calls. This guy had everything at his disposal, all right? So when he's speaking, whether you like it or not, we should listen because he knows from experience and from a download of supernatural wisdom what he's talking about. And uh, the first thing he says, he says, pursuing wealth is extremely unfulfilling, Seeking what? It's not wealth. It's the pursuit of it. It's the, and again, if you have a business and you're trying to make money, that doesn't mean this is you, okay? I, what we're talking about is that incessant desire to become wealthier and wealthier that leads to a lack of satisfaction in life, all right? Some of you don't know, but here's the crazy thing. You can pursue wealth and be rich. You can pursue wealth and be poor. You can, it's called a spirit of poverty. You can have a spirit of poverty no matter how much money you have or don't have. So he's trying to address something in all of us, saying, look, many people are after wealth. They're after riches. And it's not wrong to prosper because the Bible tells us to prosper. It actually says in Deuteronomy 8.18 that God is the God who gives, who gives us power to make wealth. So God isn't contradicting himself. It's not wrong to have money. It's wrong to be in love with money, right? It's not wrong to have wealth. It's wrong to crave it as though it is the fulfillment of life. All right, so what Solomon's saying, verse 10, he says it's the love of money. We can be greedy and deceived, never have enough, and it, money does not provide in itself, it doesn't provide actual deep satisfaction and happiness. Num and then he says in verse 11, he says, hey, if you have money, the other issue is you can be taken advantage of. You've always got friends who want to help you spend your money on them, and, uh, and then you kind of wonder, who are my friends? Another issue is you can lose sleep over worrying about your empire. So you've got all this stuff. The more stuff you have, the more you have to steward it, the more you have to worry about it, the more you have to take care of it, the more you have to polish it and, you know, protect it from rust and, right? <laughs> uh, you can end up taking foolish risks. That really what he's talking about is over-leveraging. He's saying, look, when you have wealth, you have, you have buying power and you have leveraging power. So the problem is you can overextend your credit. How many of you know that in the recent, you know, housing market turn in 2000, really started about 2006, a lot of people lost everything because they were over leveraged, right? They were very optimistic. This is kind of what that's talking about. When you have money and you have access to things, you can over leverage yourself and end up with nothing because you make what he calls risky investments. The whole mortgage industry went that way, right? So many loans that shouldn't have been ever, ever uh, approved were approved because there was this, oh, there was this really, it was greed. There was a lot of greed driving the entire culture. And so prospering is one thing, being greedy is another, okay? And then he says you can work hard, but the problem is you can't take it with you. There's no, uh, there's no caskets with tow-along trailers, you know? You just, you can't take any of it with you. Uh, you. Your body dies, so you can't grab anything. Even if you put gold coins in your casket, you can't carry them into eternity because your soul goes on, not your body, right? You get a new body. So you can't take any of that with you. And then he finishes with this. He says, the other problem, the final problem is, is when you pursue wealth in the wrong way, when you pursue it in the wrong way, you can live under a constant cloud of what he calls frustration, discouragement, and anger. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but if we were honest, probably all of us at some point in trying to gain wealth have experienced this. Frustration, what's he call it? discouragement and anger where you're just like oh that that thing didn't work out that business deal fell through that person didn't keep their promise and it's because we're trying to build wealth and it's you know it's falling through our fingers we're like oh you know and so basically he's describing humanity isn't he I mean he's described maybe not you you guys look so spiritual today so not one of you knows what we're talking about here but I do I have under, I understand this uh, I've never really been after money to be honest with you I'm not that kind of a person but who doesn't want to have more um, wealth? I mean, we all would like to have more wealth, so I can admit that. Thank you, my friend. There's two of us. So anyway, let me just, let me just move this over here. So let's just talk to you. All right, forget about that. Okay, so anyway, Mike, what I want to say is, <laughs> verse 18, brother, there's a tone change. All right? And the tone change begins with this word, even so. Even so, Mike, what happens is for guys like you and I, there's hope. There's hope. Because it says, even so, I want to give you a new truth. All right? Any of you want to listen in? Because I'm... All right, all right. I'm gonna, I'll scoot it back then. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page here. Because I want to talk to you if you don't want me to talk to you. I mean, yeah, yeah. It gets a little crazy there. Okay. 
So here's what he says, even so I've noticed in the midst of all that craziness, in the midst of those human tendencies, in the midst of that human weakness, human frailty, human ambition, human greed, in the midst of all that stuff, he says, I see a sliver of good. And this is kind of the tenor of Ecclesiastes. He's like, goes, bad, 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 oh, but there's something good. It's kind of like that through the whole book. It's like vanity, vanity, but there's something good here. No, 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 there's something good here. And so that's why you got to read the book and look for those slivers of encouragement because they're just, they're shrouded by lots of discouragement, lots of like, wow, this is a bummer. But you know what? It's a wake-up call. The book of Ecclesiastes is like a wake-up call. It's a very good book. Uh, One of these days I'm going to preach on it. It's such a good book. Anyway, so he says, look, he says, there's something that's good. He says, it's good for people to, it's interesting, he says, eat, drink, He doesn't say eat, drink, and be merry. He says it's good for you to eat, drink, and enjoy, which is kind of like be merry, but enjoy your work and accept your lot in life. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't strive to improve or shouldn't strive. It just means if you find yourself uh, born a certain gender, born a certain location, born to certain parents, don't hate life. He's saying, look, there's certain things you need to accept. We talked about the serenity prayer. God, help me to accept the things I cannot change. There's things you can't change. And what he's saying is if you can learn to accept the things that you can't change and enjoy your life, enjoy your work, it's, it's, it's amazing. And there aren't that many people that are living that way, that are truly able to accept their lot in life and enjoy their work. Most people, if you interview most people, they're going to say, yeah, I hate my job. I can't stand my job. I'm bored with my job. I don't like my job. Inevitable, it's the majority of people. Christian and not, okay? Now, if you don't like your job, I'm not criticizing you. That's fine. Just hear the spirit of what's being said. It's good for people to eat, drink, enjoy their work, and accept their lot in life. And then he says this, it's good to receive wealth from God. Did you catch that? So it sounds like he's contradicting himself, but he says, look, there's a difference between striving after wealth where it makes you miserable and receiving wealth as the byproduct of doing what's right. So you do what's right, you, you build a kingdom business and you receive wealth from God and you say, thank you, Lord, and you're no longer frustrated, angry, upset. You're like, wow, this is awesome. I'm living under the favor and the blessing of God. There's a difference. So it's not about the wealth itself. It's about how you got it. And we can get it the wrong way, which is the frustrating way, or we can get it as a gift from God. I shared with you last week how I used to judge wealthy people because I had a spirit of poverty. So I'm free from that now. God can prosper me and sometimes... I experience that radical prosperity. It's amazing. And I'm learning how to be content in every situation. We've we've had more than other times and less other times. We've not had any way to pay our bills sometimes. Other times we've paid other people's bills. And it's all awesome, to be honest with you. But anyway, he says it's good to receive wealth from God and the health to enjoy it. So he says, first of all, if you can enjoy your life and if you can be healthy enough to enjoy your life, That's awesome. But then he says this amazing thing. He says, enjoying your work and accepting your lot in life is actually a gift. I just want you to hear this. Enjoyment is a gift from God. The ability to enjoy your life is a gift from God. Some people seem to be born with it. Other people need to get it. But it's a gift from God. Either way, it's a gift from God. Hello? Hello? But this, is, this last statement is incredible. He says, God wants to keep you and I busy, so busy with enjoyment that we don't have time to brood over the past. All right, now I'm just going to ask you to be bold. Raise your hand if you've ever brooded over the past. Go ahead, just everybody put your hand up. <laughs> now some of us should have two hands up. Because we really brood. We like live our lives brooding, brooding, brooding. And God wants to give you a gift today. You don't have to do that. He does not want you and I to brood over our past. You can learn from your past. You can benefit from your past. But you shouldn't brood over your past. The Lord doesn't want us to live in constant regret. You can regret certain things, certain decisions, but they don't have to control you. So many people brood. Brooding means you go over it and over it and over it in your mind and your soul. And it actually determines your mood and your outlook. When you brood, it determines your mood and your outlook. The Lord's saying this, I'm willing to give you a gift so you don't have to do that anymore. Does that sound like a deal? Many of us are aware that in 
certain third world developing countries, there are children who have next to nothing compared to us. They have a tattered shirt on their back and shorts and that's, and maybe flip flops if they're lucky. And yet they have more joy than we have. It's very, very common. How in the world can that be? It's called the gift of enjoyment. And you know what's amazing? The book of James, chapter 2, verse 5, says that the Lord has chosen the poor to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. In other words, the poor automatically get gifts that we have to ask him for. Hear what I'm saying. The poor automatically get free gifts that we don't get. And if you're poor, you get a free gift that other people don't get. It's called being rich in faith and inheriting the kingdom. That's an amazing thing. Everybody else gets the kingdom if you receive it. The poor get it automatically. You're like, that can't be right. Read James, read James 2, 5. That's what it says. God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom, to be heirs of the kingdom. Automatic, automatic benefit. In other words, economically, this is so unjust, I'm going to give them a free gift. Enjoyment is one of those gifts. That's why every time, you know, people go to a third world country and they come back like, I was moved to tears, they're so happy and they have nothing. Exactly, they have the gift of enjoyment. I mean, so many countries I go in and kids are, they have a stick and they have an old wheel, a, a bicycle wheel, and they just, but it's beautiful, it, it actually makes me want to weep because they're, they're just laughing and giddy. And it reminds me of my own childhood. We weren't that poor, but we, it was the simple things that would make you happy. You know, when I was a kid, it's like it didn't take much to make us happy. Today, if you don't have an iPad and a, you know, a, your own uh, network account, Facebook, it's like people throw, kids throw temper tantrums. I'm like, man, there is something to be said for the old days when it was so simple. It didn't take as much. I mean, a couple of sticks, a rock, and an imagination, and you could do all kinds of stuff, Right? God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith. But the bigger issue is this. Whether you have money or not, there's something called the gift of enjoyment. And the Lord wants you and I to have that. We're going to pray. Our ministry time today is going to include prayer for the gift of, of enjoyment. Sorry, I meant to say gift of enjoyment. The gift of enjoyment is an actual gift from God that every believer must have. If you don't have the gift of enjoyment, you cannot Enjoy your life. Read Ecclesiastes 5 very carefully. It's really fun in the New Living Translation or the Living Bible because it just says it so plainly. But I just want to encourage you to ask God for the gift of enjoyment, especially if that's not your nature. Some people are born almost with the gift of enjoyment and they just, they enjoy life so easily. They have other issues. They do. Because this thing is a balance. It really is. It's a, it's a paradox cycle. So they got the enjoyment thing down, but they, they need the next thing we're going to talk about in a second. But that's okay. We're talking about enjoyment right now. I want to encourage you to ask God for this gift called enjoyment. I saw this when I was a teenager. I read this in Ecclesiastes, and I thought, I need this gift. I'm not wired this way. Not that I hate life or anything. Don't get me wrong. It's just that my nature was always the more, the striving, the wanting, the going after. And I said, I need the gift of enjoy. I need this gift. And I began to ask God for it. And man, I'm not saying I'm there, but I'm so different than I used to be. Like, I really enjoy life now. And I, there's areas I need to grow, and that's, that's okay. That's your whole, that's everybody's life. But I, ha I know that I have the gift of enjoyment because I ask God for it. And everybody in this room, the cool thing about these promises is they're the great leveler. Everybody gets access to the same promises. Everybody can have them if you want them. Let's read another passage in Scripture. This is Luke 13. If you want to turn your Bible to Luke 13, just, yeah, leave it there for just a sec. Luke 13, we're going to read verses 22 through 28. I want to kind of give you the opposite truth now. The opposite truth. You guys with me? We doing okay? All right. These are super simple outlines. There's like point one, point two. Super simple. Verse 22, Jesus was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching as he went his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, now listen to this, Lord, are there just a few people being saved? This is a very important question. It's being asked a ton right now. Lord, are there just a few people being saved? And this is what he, this is his answer. Jesus didn't be, no, 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 everybody's going to, this isn't how Jesus answered. Listen to how he answered. Strive to enter through the narrow door, for I tell you, many will seek to enter and will not be able. 
wow. It's very different than what's being taught today. I'm not saying this because I only want a few. I want everyone to get saved. I'm just telling you what the Bible says, all right? Just, we're, just reading a, we're reading a few verses here, all right? Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open up to us, then he will answer and say to you, I don't know where you're from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. Now, this scripture is amazing when you juxtapose it to the one we just read. Just listen. We ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you're from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves being thrown out. Now, that's a hard scripture. I admit that. But I want you to hear the heart of God and hear what the Lord is saying, okay? You guys good? You got a few more minutes of truth? Can we handle a few more minutes of truth? The second point is this. The S, of course, is striving. The riches of joy and hope are reserved. They belong to striving believers. Now, I know that word is hard for many of you, striving. We don't want to strive. Biblically speaking, you do want to strive. Just so you know, the Bible is opposite of what many Christians say. Many Christians say, no, no, never strive. The Bible says strive. It's actually a command to strive in about almost 10 places. All right, I'm going to give you a few today. But anyway, it's a very challenging reality for a lot of people. Some people actually try to change what the Bible says. They read it with an eraser, with whiteout. They're like, oh, I've got to white that out. I don't like that. I'm going to get rid of that. Don't read the Bible with an eraser. Don't read it with whiteout. Just read it. All right? And to be clear, when Jesus used the word strive, I want to help you unpack this so you know what word he's using. It's the Greek word agonizomai. Does that sound like anything? Agonize. What it means, it's a compound word. It means to labor, to struggle, to agonize, and to contend like an Olympic athlete competing for the gold medal. Think about how much training Olympic athletes go into. That's the word agonizomai. Jesus is saying, be like an Olympic athlete in coming into the kingdom. Just think about that for a minute. It's a command, it's not an option, and it's to everybody. Jesus is actually saying total effort, full-on competition, blood, sweat, and tears, and give it everything you've got. Now let me ask you, where is that in your life? Especially if you're an enjoyment person. Where is the agonizing in your life? Where are you working so hard now, what's crazy is that the Bible talks about Jesus in prayer, agonizing in prayer. It's the same Greek word when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the actual same word, agonosmai. It means he, he prayed so hard, he sweat great drops of blood, which in many scholars think he's, his corpuscles, like, like things began to snap because he was praying with such intensity. That's striving. That's what striving looks like. I wonder if we've ever, just the American church, if we've ever touched that place in prayer. We're so quick to disqualify anybody who tries hard. Okay, don't strive, brother. Jesus did it all at the cross. Don't, don't actually have, you don't have to do anything. Yeah, you don't have to do anything. To, you're not adding to the cross. You're accessing the cross. You're striving to enter into the benefit of the cross. Why do you think so many say, Lord, Lord, but very few enter because there's a striving required and we're so hyper-religious, we talk each other out of the striving. Are we okay? Now listen. Jesus is saying that striving is vital for you to have joy and hope. Striving is vital. I wonder how many people have written off striving and have very little joy and hope because they're actually not doing their part. Verse 23 through 25, they ask the Lord, are only a few being saved? Jesus' answer is not, oh, oh, no, my son, God is good. Pretty much everyone's going to be saved. Ha, ah, don't worry. That's not the answer at all. He pretty much agrees with the assessment and says, many will try to come, but will not be able, so strive. That's the point. Strive, struggle, agonize, labor, contend, compete. Go for it. Step up. Stand out. Be different than everybody else. You've got to apprehend this thing with all you've got. It's actually the command of God. Verse 26 through 28, the objection is going to be this, enjoyment. 
the objection at the gate is going to be people with enjoyment. Hey, I got the gift of enjoyment. I thought that's what I was supposed to do. I, you told me to enjoy life. You said eat, drink, and enjoy my lot in life. And Jesus is going to say, you got half of it right. It's a paradox cycle, son. It's a paradox cycle, daughter. I want you to be an enjoyable striver. Enjoyable striver. I want you to enjoy life as you strive to walk it out. I want you to strive with all you got and enjoy the process. Because here's what it says. Did we not eat and drink? Didn't we just read a scripture in Ecclesiastes 5 that said we should eat and drink? It's commanded to eat and drink and enjoy our life. If we can eat and drink and enjoy our life, it's a gift from God. But there's another gift. It's called striving. It's the gift of going for it. It's the gift of striving. It's the gift of putting all you've got in this thing called Christian, the Christian life. Is anybody listening? A people of enjoyment were the ones that were left out because they didn't get the striving part. That's why balance has to be the balance of fullness. Complete enjoyment with complete striving. The people who strive without enjoyment are absolutely miserable. And the people who enjoy without striving are absolutely going nowhere. They are. They, they talk a good game. Oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to. And they just never do it. They always just talk about it because they don't strive. They don't. They're always like, oh, well, I tried. Strivers don't try. They get it done. They get her done. It's a fascinating, fascinating set of scriptures. Eat, drink, and enjoy your life. It's a gift from God. But don't just eat, drink, and enjoy your life. Go for it. Strive. Sweat, contend, agonize, struggle, and enjoy the struggle. Because think about it. If we're always called to enjoy and we're always called to agonize, then we must have to learn how to enjoy the struggle. Otherwise, you're going to go, okay, I'm enjoying my life. Okay, it's time to stop enjoying life. I now need to struggle. That's how many Christians live. That's why so, much, so few believers actually have a devotional life because they're like, no, no, yeah, he loves me. Whoa, how he loves me. Oh, wait, I got to have a devotional life. He loves me. No, 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 no. What if they came together? What if it's like the alarm goes off and instead of, no, no, little flesh, it's okay. You don't have to get out of bed. Your daddy loves you. You don't have to do anything. No, you just get out of bed. You're like, I don't want to miss being with my heavenly daddy, so I'm going to get up. My flesh is going to say no. I'm going to say yes, and we're going to do this thing. Hello? And just in case you think that this is an anomaly in Scripture, I just want to finish up here with a couple of other texts. 1 Corinthians 9. You remember that one? Paul says, all run the race, but only one gets the prize. Do you remember what he says? Exercise striving. Exercise self-control. Get mastery over your own body. Like, deal with your flesh. Like, that's what he says. He says, make it your slave. It's the same word that Jesus used. Colossians chapter 1, in making disciples and actually having fruit in the kingdom. Paul says, I was chosen to be a preacher of the gospel, which is a mystery that has now been revealed, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose, I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. A lot of people think that when we have his power, we don't have to strive. The Bible says when you have his power, you will strive because you'll be striving in his power. A lot of people think his power and our striving don't go together. It's the exact opposite. We strive in his power, which means there's effort involved. There's effort involved, guys. It's supernaturally empowered effort, but it's still effort. You still got to do something. It's not you set yourself on auto, auto, you know, automation and you just kind of, you're robotic. No, no, you got to put in some effort. And God infuses that effort with his supernatural power so you don't become as exhausted as you would without it. And then 1 Timothy 4, Paul tells his spiritual son, Timothy, son, I want you to be a good minister. Here's how you do it. Discipline yourself, train yourself to be godly. And he says, this is why we labor and strive, because of the hope of the living God. In other words, hope produces striving. Joy and hope happen because we strive, and joy and hope are produced by striving. So it's not that striving removes hope. Striving increases hope. Hope produces striving. Striving increases hope. It goes together. I just want you to see the causal link, 
Joy and hope and striving belong together. Hello? I know that sounds counterintuitive. I get it. Anytime you train for almost any athletic endeavor, you have to learn muscle memory, and it's almost always counterintuitive. Golfing is a great example. There are so many bad golfers, including myself, because it's not intuitive to golf correctly. You have to learn how to golf correctly. You have to train your muscles. You want to, put, you want to pick your head up every... Your, your body wants to look before that swing is... You want to go like this right here. And you want to hit the ball blindly. Your, your body wants so bad to do that. And you have to learn to look down and to trust that you're going to see the ball after it's already in the air. It's the most difficult thing. When you water ski... It's so counterintuitive to water ski because you have to grab onto the rope, put your, bend your knees, put the skis, ski or skis in front of you, and you have to hang on for dear life, especially if it's a slow boat, which life is often a slow boat. It's spraying water in your face, and all you want to do is either stand up, lean forward. You want to do something that's going to make you fall, but you have, to, you have to remember the rules. You have to remember how it works and stay in that position until you stand up. Hello? It's counterintuitive. That's why striving is so important, because you learn how to do the kingdom. Is anybody listening today? It's a total paradox. Totally enjoy life and totally strive in life. Most people can't do that, so they either pick enjoyment or striving. Most people are enjoyable non-strivers or striving non-enjoyers. It's difficult to be both. It's difficult to be totally enjoying life and totally going for it in life. It's difficult. So, quickly, here's a couple of keys, a couple of conclusions. Uh, going on to the next slide. We're going to go ahead and go there right now on that next slide. He's talking to the slide guy. There he is. All right, beautiful. I see it. It's coming in the name of Jesus. Conclusions, applications. Number one, one of the keys to life is enjoyable striving, okay? That's what we just said. The key is enjoyable striving. Number two, you have to decide that joy and hope belong to you. I've said this all three weeks. You have to decide that you, you get joy, and joy and hope belong to you, not to your neighbor, not to somebody else only, but to you. You are the inheritor of joy and hope. Can you go to the next? Um, there you go. Decide joy and hope belong to you. Go to the next one, please. You've got you to gotta ask God for what you lack. So if you lack enjoyment, you've got to ask God for the gift of enjoyment. And if you lack the striving, you've got to ask God for that, because it's not going to come naturally. It's okay to be wired a certain way. It's okay to have propensities. That's fine. But to be a person of joy and hope, you're going to need both. People that only have enjoyment and no striving, they're never going to have full joy and hope. And people that only have striving and don't have enjoyment, they're never going to have full joy and hope. You've got to have both to fully be alive in God. You've got to have both. So ask God for what you lack. Number four, push the pedal of your weak leg. If you're great at enjoyment and not so great at striving, write down some areas that you need to strive and grow in. Like, like literally, come to the goal seminar on Saturday. Like, literally go there. And if you're really good at striving and not good at enjoyment, you've got to set some goals in enjoyment. What are you doing to enjoy life? What are you doing to enjoy your life? Seriously. Which brings us to the next one, which is learn from your opposite. There are many people around you. If you're a striver, there are a ton of people around you that know how to enjoy life. And you've got you to gotta learn from them. And if you're an enjoyer, there are a ton of people around you that know how to strive. And you've got to learn from You've got to humble yourself and learn from other people that you're not like. If you just stay in yourself, you're never going to develop into the person God wants you to be because you're, you're incomplete. Well, the reason we need the body of Christ is because the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. We need each other. We need to become enjoyable strivers. So wherever we're weak, we need to find somebody or some people around us that can help us become that person. A lot of my growth has been because I've been around people that are not like me, and I, and I learn from them. I watch them. I listen to them. They tell me. They say, no, Mark, that's not quite it. And it helps me, and we all need that. And lastly, I want to encourage you to be accountable. Decide to let people know that you're on a journey towards either enjoyment or striving. And go there and say, help me. When you see me striving too much, help me to enjoy life. Or when you see me enjoying life so much that I don't go for anything, I, I make excuses and I always, help me. Be accountable. Enjoyment people are the worst at accountability when it comes to striving. They'll duck it at every turn. 
which is why we need accountability. And striving people are also very reluctant to allow anyone to tell them to enjoy life. They get really mad. So they need to chill out and listen to enjoyment people <laughs> because enjoyment people can tell you, you need to mellow out, Mr. Striver. All right? We need to trust the people around us to help us find that place of fullness, of the balance of fullness. Does this make sense? Is this helping anyone besides me? Come on, this is the truth, beloved. All right, so we're going to have a ministry team available. I want to just pray quickly for you. And if you would like prayer beyond this general prayer, please come forward, have somebody lay hands on you. But I just want to pray God will release the gift of enjoyment and the gift of striving in a godly way, a godly gift of striving that will no longer make excuses and duck it. We would embrace it. Train yourself to be godly. Does that make sense? Let's receive from the Lord right now because we need it to be him. Amen? Amen. Father, I ask you this morning to release to your precious people some Christmas gifts. Lord, I ask for the gift of enjoyment to be released to every hungry heart. Lord, every one of us need to live a life of enjoyment. But God, though some of us just need a download today. Lord, we've been striving and striving, but we really haven't been enjoying life. And God, I ask you to release the ability to enjoy our lives in the midst of the striving, in the midst of the challenge, in the midst of what's not right, what's not complete, what's not perfect. God, I pray for the ability to enjoy life, enjoy our work, accept our lot in life. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to release right now a download to every person that's asking the gift of enjoyment in Jesus' name. And Lord, I ask for the ones that just, they know that they avoid striving at all costs, even biblical striving. I ask you, God, to give them, if they would like it, give them the gift of godly striving, godly striving that you talked about, Jesus, that your servant Paul talked about, that godly place of striving that's so right Lord, that we're wired for, that we're made for, God, that makes life worth doing. God, would you give the gift of godly striving? In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. There's going to be ministry team available.